Hello friends. Steve from Southern Illinois. Cheryl, I took your suggestion. It's cold outside. Hello friends. Steve from Southern Illinois. Uh, yeah, Cheryl, I took your suggestion today. It's cold outside and I was having trouble finding the on switch on my brain today. So we're going to do this from inside. <clears throat> We've been talking the last couple of weeks about lukewarm Christians and the Bible's message to Laodiceans, the Christians of our time. It was my senior year in high school. There was a basketball tournament being held. And um, all that stands out in my mind is the final game. There was one player from a school in Minnesota, Barry was his name, and he'd been dominating the tournament. He was a good player, but even more, he was a team leader. Even though he could make baskets like crazy, he consistently was passing off and, and coaching his team members. Well, the jocks on the other, in the other schools just didn't like him didn't help that the girls were gaga for him that you know he didn't fit the jock profile very well and uh, the final game was between his school and my school and the jocks in my school let it be known that they were going to take Barry down and he wasn't going to leave the court unscathed things were going to get rough well they did get rough so rough, in fact, that um, by halftime, all of the first string players and most of the second string players from my school had fouled out. Now, this was an away game. Um, there was a, a band concert, a band festival going on at the same time as the tournament. So there were a lot of us music geeks around. And they actually asked me to play. Now, when somebody asked me to play basketball in high school, let me tell you, they were desperate. So here I am out on the court, stumbling and bumbling around. I don't remember any of the plays. I don't remember much of the game at all, except for one thing, the trash talk. You see... <clears throat> those star first string basketball players, the jocks from my school, they were on the sidelines side trash talking like crazy. Not against Barry or the team we were playing, but against us. <laughs> well, <clears throat> meanwhile, Barry waltzed up and down the court, leading his team to score after score. <clears throat> We lost horribly, <clears throat> and I have never been so humiliated, embarrassed, and frustrated in my entire life. Not at the opposing team, but at the trash talk from my classmates. Now, in sports culture, trash talk can include any verbal or nonverbal communications that's intended to undermine a person's confidence or ruin his reputation okay they can be insulting demeaning degrading or simply boastful but the goal is to win the contest by playing with his mind <clears throat> and the best trash talk is understated there's a there's this iconic moment in basketball history Carl Malone was a, uh, an outstanding basketball player for the Utah Jazz back in the 1990s. He was nicknamed the mailman because he always delivered. But in 1997, the Jazz were playing the Chicago Bulls. That was the Michael Jordan era. <clears throat> it was the NBA Finals. It was a Sunday. The game was tied. And there were only nine seconds left on the clock. And Carl was at the free throw line. Now, if he made his shots, 
there was a good chance he was going to win the game for the Jazz. It was a high pressure situation. But as the 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 players were lining up for the for the free free throw shot, Scottie Pippen, another one of one of the players on the car, the Chicago Bulls, kind of ambled past Carl Malone and just kind of said softly under his breath the mailman doesn't deliver on Sundays. And Carl just snorted. I mean, <laughs> the play on his nickname Sunday. I mean, it was just, it was humorous. But it took his mind off the game. And he missed that first shot. As he was getting ready for the second shot and the players were lining up, he saw Scotty ambling towards him again. And he just, he just <clears throat> abruptly wheeled and said, I know, I know, and retreated back to midcourt, trying to get his head back into the game. But it was no use. He, he missed the second shot. And seconds later, Michael Jordan scores and the Bulls win the game. Uh, trash talk doesn't have to be obscene. It doesn't have to be crude. It only has to be effective at undermining a person's confidence or damaging their reputation. Now, what does this have to do with Christians being lukewarm? Well, last week I suggested that there are three tests for determining your spiritual temperature, our spiritual temperature. Uh, the first was love. John 13, 35. Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love each other. This commandment was at the core of the new Christian community. And it drew together a diverse group of people. But when they stepped outside, they were immersed in a trash talk culture. Jews trashed Gentiles and Samaritans. Pharisees trash talk everybody. Romans, non-Romans, and everyone trash talk slaves. You can see the challenge this created. No matter how good our intentions or how strong our beliefs, when we're surrounded by a culture with opposing values, what happens when we come into church? Crossover leakage is so easy to happen. It's very difficult to remain true to our calling as Christians when we're surrounded by a trash talk culture. And it begs the question, does love have limits? Well, I find three stories from, from the Gospels meaningful here. Okay, The first comes from Matthew chapter 5, uh, verses 21 and 22. This is, this is part of the Sermon on the Mount, a collection of Jesus' sayings. And I'm reading it from the God's Word translation here. You have heard that it was said to your ancestors, Never murder. Whoever murders will answer for it in court. But I can guarantee that whoever is angry with another believer will answer for it in court. And whoever calls another believer an insulting name will answer for it in a higher court. Whoever calls another believer a fool will answer for it in hellfire. Jesus equated trash talk with murder. Luke 10, 25 to 37. <clears throat> Here someone asked him what the greatest commandment was. And he responded that the greatest commandment was loving God and the second was like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And immediately his questioner shot back, but just who is my neighbor? And Jesus responded with the story of the good Samaritan. Now, Samaritans were despised by Jews in his culture. They despised them because they thought of them as followers of a corrupted religion. 
apostates. They claimed to accept the writings of Moses, but they interpreted them differently and they had different practices. And yet Jesus was telling his audience that these believers in false doctrine, these apostates, these deceivers, were included in the commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. That's like telling Christians, love Muslims like, your, like the people in church, or Catholics, love Protestants, or Seventh-day Adventists, love shepherd rods. Really? The third is John chapter 4, verses 1 through 43. This is the, the episode where Jesus meets a Samaritan woman at a well at noon. You can read the story for yourself if you don't remember it. How did Jesus interact with her? Well, he made no attempt to correct the beliefs of this misguided apostate woman until she asked him about what was right and wrong, what was true and false. And then he gave her a very short answer, but then immediately refocused her back to her relationship with God. It wasn't that he ignored truth. He was simply focused on greater issues than what church people were arguing about. With that as context, let's read Jesus' prayer for his disciples that's found in John chapter 17, verses 20 and 21 is the part that I want to focus on. And this time I'm reading from the World English Bible. Not for these only do I pray, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one that the world may believe that I sent you. What I want to suggest, well, first of all, last week when we talked about those thermometers, the first one called me to examine my relationships with the people I identified with, my neighbors, those I call brother and sister. This second thermometer forces me to confront those that I don't agree with, I don't identify with. Jesus prayed that all of his followers would be one, that they would walk in unity, in harmony. What I want to suggest is that trash talk is actually ubiquitous within Christian circles. But we are so lukewarm that we don't even recognize it. What am I talking about? Christians trash, Christian trash talk is often very understated, but it always carries the message, this person is an imposter. They're not a real believer. These people can't be trusted. You don't belong. We make caricatures of people from other churches and religions to ridicule them and discredit them and what they're saying. We use code words like Catholic, Jesuit, liberal, conservative, and when we use those words, it communicates a bucket load of disrespect, suspicion, accusation. We claim to love everyone. But love, genuine love, speaks with respect. It approaches with empathy and compassion. It acts with generosity. Our actions belie our words. We don't love people. We love ourselves and those who we think are like us. Every time we act like this, every time we talk these, this language, every time we think this way, we reveal that we are far from united 
because we exclude large portions of Jesus' followers. Proving ourselves right is more important to us than loving our neighbor like ourselves. We stand with the lawyer asking Jesus, but just who is my neighbor? And our words and our actions put us at risk for judgment and hellfire. Friends, people who are united don't trash talk even when they disagree. They love each other. And love covers a multitude of sins. According to Jesus, this love, this unity, is what defines his disciples and what will win souls for him. In 1891, Burton Johnson penned these words in his commentary on John 17. There is no other source of skepticism so fruitful as church quarrels and sectarian divisions. Those words are as true today as they were more than a hundred years ago. So take these thermometers, stick them in your mouth, hold them there for a while. Love, unity, What's your temperature today? Be safe, my friends. Be prudent. But above all, keep looking up. I hope to see you next week.